Thank you for staying with us. The Banking Sector Recapitalization Program is a regulatory initiative of the Central Bank of Nigeria that requires banks to beef up their long-term capital to have a level required by the monetary authorities and to ensure security of shareholders' funds. CBN in March had raised the capital requirement of banks in the country, giving them a two-year period to meet the, need, the new capital base or explore other options such as mergers, acquisitions, or downgrade of banking license. According to the new requirement, commercial banks with international licenses are required to have a capital base of 500 billion naira, while their national and regional counterparts are required to have capital base of 200 billion naira and 50 billion naira, respectively. Similarly, the capital base of national non-interest banks were raised to 20 billion naira, while that of regional non-interest was raised to 10 billion naira. Now, merchant banks' capital base was also raised to 50 billion naira. The Apex Bank also marked uh, today as uh, the deadline for banks to submit their recapitalization plans to ensure speedy improvement in the banking system. Well, joining us right now via Zoom from the United Kingdom is Chartered Accountant Runke Adiagbo. Good morning. Thank you for joining us on TVC News. Good morning, Veronica. Thanks for having me. Now, a majority of persons uh, have a divided opinion with, with regards to this uh, recapitalization of banks, even though they agree that it is long overdue uh, for Nigeria and the economy. Uh, but there are concerns, especially with regards to inflation and every other thing uh, on the ground that is happening with regards to the economy. But uh, the government is saying this is, is to push the $1 billion uh, economy of the president as it is. Uh, what do you make of this move by the CBN? Okay, thanks. Thank you for that question. Um, as you know, in life, there is always the good side to things and there is always the bad side to things. So like any new policy, there is always a good Good points. Initiative by our central bank uh, is a welcome development. Essentially, it's going to enhance the stability and capacity of our banks. And you know, for any country to thrive economically, it needs a formidable banking sector. So this initiative will create resilience within the banking sector and to make sure they are well capitalized and uh, essentially too big to fall. Because we don't want a situation whereby banks are collapsing and the deposits of um, uh, deposits are disappearing, and it doesn't give investors confidence. So, with this increase in capitalization, it will give investors confidence, and it will ensure that our economy kickstarts our economy, and to make sure our bank are well resourced. Because, as you would appreciate, the last time we did this exercise was under uh, Professor Soludo when he was the um, governor of Central Bank, and that was in two, 2004. So that's 20 years ago. So if you look at it from an international perspective and what interest rate is done to the Naira, it wiped out the capital base of most international Nigerian banks. So it will be naive of anyone to say this is not a good initiative because the capital base is essentially being wiped away by inflation and also the uh, adverse movement in, in interest rates. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a welcome development. So looking at the fact that we had it, you know, more than 20 years ago and then the time to do it again is now uh, so that the banks can actually, you know, whatever they do at the end of the day will have positive impact on the economy. But if you have to review what was done back in the day, the impact of the last policy, how the impact it had on the banks, what would you, how would you review it? Do you think it was a success? Right. So when it was done 20 years ago, essentially 20, 89 banks became collapsed into... 25 banks and essentially bigger capital base and having a bigger capital base is surely a good thing for the banking sector now is the time to do it again because 20 years is a long time in the, the financial industry and for us to make sure we are well placed and we can compete internationally our banks can compete internationally it is a very good time to review this capitalization threshold and to make sure the banks are fit for purpose 
Mm. Interesting. When you talk about being fit for purpose, uh, there are those who say that uh, uh, banks, like you mentioned, the 89 banks, and then we saw some mergers happening, and that is where concerns are being raised. For some experts in this field, they are talking about loss of jobs and some other issues uh, that will spring up when we see some of uh, when we see what happens at the end of the day with this recapitalization how do you uh, position this matter being raised talking about loss of jobs when you're also looking at um, improving the economy with this strategy i tend to want to look at it from a positive positive lens now if your if banks are well capitalized right they've got huge resources most of them will want to convert the cash liabilities actually to as uh, interest yielding assets. So there will be the propensity to want to actually give out more cheaper loans. And if they give out more cheaper loans to investors, to entrepreneurs, to corporates, the possibility is that it will expand the sector. And that will mean that they will have to recruit more staff. So therefore increase employment. So I'm looking at it from those lenses. Margins and acquisitions is not a bad thing. It's good for the economy because if we have organizations that are too fragmented and could possibly collapse, having a merger, making sure they're well reinforced and well capitalized, surely is a good thing, in my opinion. Mm. Interesting. So, uh, as a result of this, many banks are already, you know, preparing to float uh, rights issue to recapitalize by deploying various options uh, for capital injection. What are these options? Options, and what do you consider their implications? Okay, so essentially, the old banking sector is looking for just over 4 trillion naira within the next 24 months because the deadline is 24 months. Today is the deadline for them to submit their proposal yeah. to Central Bank in terms of how they plan to meet that threshold. So they've got 24 months now to look for that money. So we're looking for just over 4, they're looking for just over 4 trillion naira, and that is a lot of money. So as you rightly said, there is the opportunity of public offering, right? There is opportunity of rights issues. There's also private placement. There's mergers and acquisition. They go for mergers and acquisition. Also, it's a good opportunity for foreign direct investment. So other international organizations or individuals internationally can bring in FX, you know, to be able to invest in the banking sector. So the banking sector will be the area of growth for the, for the country because many people would now want to invest in the banking sector. That might create a bit of disruption, especially in the um, um, stock exchange because... Other organizations like manufacturing and oil and gas, people might be diverted from investing in them, but would rather invest in the bank to meet that threshold. Because even bankers now will be running elter skelter to find that money. They will be lobbying, you know, rich, um, high net worth people, you know, to be able to achieve that. But it must be achieved. And today is the deadline for them to submit their their proposal. So as I listed, there are about four or five ways in which they can raise that capital. But I'm more interested in foreign direct investment because as you know we've got um foreign exchange challenges so if mm. you could use this opportunity of the recapitalization to attract more foreign investment which will come along with forex into the country that would actually help to stabilize the naira and it will make sure as an, as a country uh, economically we are moving towards stability right now the other question uh, that uh, some have asked is how ready is the capital market for, for this recapitalization, uh, if the capacity is there? So recently, the stock exchange was uh, restructured. So I envisage it's in preparation for things like this. So they actually rebranded and renamed them as NGX. So in my opinion, I think they've been building capacity, the stock exchange has been building capacity and gearing themselves up for this. Because they know it's been a long time we've done this. So they, they, they saw it coming anyway. So I think they are well-placed to be prepared for this huge uh, activity in the capital market to make sure our banking sector is reinforced. Mm. And in talking about the, the uh, I read that the Securities and Exchange Commission will soon uh, issue appropriate guidelines to facilitate an efficient capital uh, raising process for the proposed recapitalization of the banks in the country. So how do you envision the collaboration or the partnership between the SEC uh, the CBN and other relevant agencies, you know, facilitating a smooth recapitalization process, you know, for the banking industry. Okay, so um, I have a huge respect for the current governor of the central bank. 
And I think um, whatever policies is trying to introduce, it would have thought it through properly and it would have engaged all the relevant stakeholders. Because as we know, you know, huge cap uh, capital influx needs to happen with this strategy. Therefore, he needs to have engaged the banking sector, he needs to have engaged stock exchange, he needs to have engaged the regulators within the financial sector to make sure they are all ready for this before they made the announcements. Mm. Because I don't think he would have just gone, made the announcement, and then it's going back to that workout, the dynamics of how that will work. He would have engaged them, sounded them out, and make sure they are all ready. And that's why they've given them, the banks, 24 months to do this. So both the stock exchange and the banks have got two years, which I think is quite a long time for them mm. to actually put in the relevant um, resource they need to put in to make sure they are ready, to make sure... Uh, on the 31st of March 2026, you know, the banks are well capitalized and are compliant with the new recapitalization threshold. Right. Could you, could you help us expatriate, you know, some of the lessons that we learned or that were learned, you know, from previous bank recapitalization exercise that are now informing the SEC's approach to issuing guidelines uh, for the current exercise? Okay. I, I, I mean, it's quite been, it's been a long time. And um, in my opinion, I think... Probably, probably the diligent planning was not put in place well in advance. Because when you do things like this, when you implement things like this, there are lots of unintended consequences. There are risks, there's going to be risk, there's going to be a disruption to the economy. And I think that wasn't well thought out because we found ourselves in a situation where banks were running elter skelter and there was real, uh, uh, in, in the boards of the bank, there was real some very nasty mergers and acquisitions, which wasn't um, very palatable, and that created a lot of animosity within the sector because there was just a mad rush to make sure they meet that target of the um, capitalization threshold. So I think with this approach, now that we've given ourselves a long time, two years, you know, they've told the banks now to come up with their proposal, and then how they plan to implement it, they've given them two years. I think it's a well thought out process. And we are giving ourselves the time to make sure the bank can do the needful and they, 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 they don't have to be running elter skelter and there doesn't need to be any messy um, boardroom issues. Mm. Now, there, there, there are also conversations around attracting the younger generation in, in this whole drive to recapitalize the market, especially with the use of uh, technology. I, I wonder how you interpret this aspect because they are just talking about the introduction of uh, new platforms and applications which at some point did not sit well with the central bank. But you know how young people are. They want a seamless process when it comes to banking as it is. How critical is this aspect of introducing technology into this matter of recapitalization as well as also attracting the younger generation? Now, that's a very good question. Because um, this idea of recapitalizing, bringing in more capital into the banking sector, is essentially to help them um, invest in their financial infrastructure, their, their financial platforms. And you know, in this day of AI, tech, uh, AI uh, technology, the bank has no choice but to be ahead of the curve. Because in my opinion, most of the Nigerian banks are behind the digital curve. You know, they need to invest more in their tech, um, uh, digital platforms and to make sure they are fit for purpose in this modern day and they can compete favorably with other international banks. Now, as you know, young people are very, very restless and they are always very digitally savvy. So therefore, they expect a banking sector that actually meets up to their requirements in terms of digitization, digitization of the bank. Now... I read this morning in the news that um, the new phase of digital banking now, the CBN is coming down on them, or maybe they've got some concerns or they've got some issues. I was really taken aback because I thought that was the way to go, you know, digitizing the banking system and ensuring that we keep our overheads down. Because most banks now, especially uh, in the Western world, they are closing down their physical banks and actually operating online using their online platforms. And that is reducing their cost base, and therefore they can generate more dividends for their shareholders. So in my opinion, uh, banks need to be up to, um, they need to keep abreast of the changes that is happening within the sector and to make sure young people um, find their systems very friendly and can patronize them. Because as you know, we have a huge young population in Nigeria. 
So that's a big market for the banks. So they must make sure they align themselves to what these young people want. So in my opinion, this new capital injection that is going to come into the banks, they should use it to actually improve their financial infrastructure and their financial platforms to make sure it attracts the young people who are the uh, customers which they should really be seeking, in my opinion. Well, the, <clears throat> the reason the CBN gave was because of the fact that um, some people are already using it for money laundering, some are using it to sponsor terrorism, just the same you know, uh, blame they, they put on um, the, the speculators, um, the Binance of, of this world, etc. And people are saying that, okay, just like you said, uh, that they should embrace fintech, they should see the way this is disrupting, you know, the banking industry uh, in, in, other, in other climes. Uh, do you feel that it could be the whales in the banking industry, you know, talking about the conventional banks who are seeing that this thing is already giving them a run for their money and is making the younger generation, you know, the generation... X, uh, Alpha gener Generation Alpha, etc., you know, keen into this banking, uh, you know, this banking system uh, rather than the conventional world. Do you feel like it is the will of this banking industry that are, you know, trying to uh, whittle the power down? Right. So CBN, as the regulator, needs to do what they have to do. That is their job to regulate the banking sector. And surely they will have more information than we have in the public domain. So if they've got some concerns with this fintech fintech banks then they need to yeah, do what yeah, they need to do um, however as mm. we all know um, mm. with this fintech banks they've created competition for um the mm. conventional banks and so they wouldn't like it. so they will be doing whatever they can to disrupt the development all right um yeah, I believe that uh, that interference there, uh, but uh, quite interesting um, perspective yeah. she's bringing to this matter, Absolutely. especially with regards to the aspect of technology, which yeah. is critical. Uh, as the world is moving, I believe that Nigeria should move along with, with the world as it is, which is what she's also saying, so that we can attract the... the Gen Zs, yeah, Gen Alpha, Alpha, and whatever the generation <laughs> <laughs> that will come afterwards. Because these decisions are not just for the immediate, but uh, what would even outlive us at, at the end of the day. And as the world changes, the dynamics with regards to doing business also change and all of it. And it's important. But are we... Uh, right, like we usually use the word, are we matured enough mm. to, to handle some of these things? We've seen some of the criticism that has come with regards to that, because that will be uh, my next question for Runke. Runke, are you there? Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Now, the question for, for me is, are we ready as a country, from your perspective now, uh, to really handle this matter of, uh, of bringing technology into the system. You know we have a challenge with data management as it is. We have a challenge with uh, cyber security as it is. We've not been able to really deal with all of it. How can we really introduce technology to really handle uh, the seamless processes in banking? In my opinion, there's never a right time to start these things. But again, I have lots of confidence in this current administration. And the reason why is because, in my opinion, I think this current administration has put round pegs in round holes. Um, you know the person we have at the um, at the uh, Ministry of uh, Digital Economy is very, very sound in that area. And I know, he, I have confidence in him that he knows what he's doing. So he would make sure he prepares his um, ministry to make sure in terms of digital transformation within the company, we are, we are you know, ahead of the curve. So I have confidence in the capacity he has to do that. Uh, but at the same time, whether we like it or not, we all have to um, keep abreast of technological changes because the world is moving ahead and Nigeria cannot be left behind. So by default, especially with AI, we have no choice but to embrace technology. Otherwise, <laughs> it's, we are doing that at our own peril if we do not uh, embrace technology. So we've got the right person in post to lead us on that. The banks now need to play their own role to make sure they have a lot of capital to be able to develop their, their, their platforms and to make sure they reduce their overheads because with digitizations, they will reduce their overheads. 
and therefore the, the economy and their, their shareholders will benefit from it. So right. it's a very good it's a very good time, you know, to push this forward. There's never a right time. Well, I think this is the right time now. Otherwise, Nigeria will be left behind in the mm. Committee of Nations. Mm. When you say um, it will help them reduce their overhead, how do you mean? Are you talking about cut down on the number of staffers as it is? Because that is also a major concern. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, with digitization, um, in terms of physical buildings, you don't need physical buildings anymore. I don't know when last I went into a bank, banking all, because I do all my banking transactions online, right? So the same applies to the banks. They might not need all these huge buildings, which cost a lot of money in rent or in lease, in, in lease old payments. So that would reduce the, co the cost. I mean, most organizations now, their staff work from home, so they don't need to pay high rent. But the fact that you're working from home doesn't mean they don't need the human resource. You still need the human resource to operate the computers and things like that. So therefore, you reduce your rental cost and potentially you could reduce even your staffing cost as well. But staff could be retrained, could be reskilled in other areas within the business. It doesn't automatically translate to redundancy. They could be redirected to other areas within the business. Mm, interesting. But in, in now embracing fintech innovations, what specific uh, measures do you think the uh, SEC uh, could take to manage the associated risks while establishing a regulatory framework for the digital asset uh, uh, space? Right. Um, cyber security is real. It's real. And I'm really, really very proud again of the um, minister because just last week or two weeks ago, they had a cyber uh, risk, um, uh, I think, uh, like a, a summit where we had people from the international world come and talk about cyber security challenges. So to me, that means he's actually preparing the country for this potential cyber threats. As you know, Nigerians are well known all over the world for what we call the 419 um, um, issues. You understand? Nigerians are very smart. They are very digitally savvy. But sometimes they use this digital savviness in a negative way. What we want to do now is to encourage the younger generation to use their digital savviness in a positive way. But therefore, there needs to be very strong regulation. Because if you don't regulate, people will just do whatever they like. And we should make sure the penalty is huge. So the penalty stands, stands as a deterrent. Because you can't go around policing everybody. But if you make sure the penalty is huge, you know, maybe like life imprisonment or something... That would deter those potential cyber security, um, cyber security threats. So in my opinion, we have no choice about the matter. That is the direction to go. But we should put mechanisms in place to make sure the cyber space is safe in Nigeria and people feel comfortable operating, uh, you know, um, cyber, uh, operating within the Nigerian digital economy. Mm. Now... Let's look at uh, the inflationary rate and its attendant implication as we're looking to recapitalize the market. There are those who say that we may not get as much positive results from this recapitalization where we are witnessing this ever-increasing inflation rate as it is. Okay, so again, this initiative will sort of deal with inflation as a byproduct. product. That is not the real intention of um, this recapitalization by, by default it will so, so also address inflation and how do i mean without a doubt there's going to this um, initiative will mop up some money from the uh, spending their money there will be um, a constraint on disposable income because they will now use that money to actually invest in the bank so by default is mopping up extra money that is floating around in the economy and diverting it to investing in banks in banks so therefore if there is not too much money in circulation that would address inflation so instead of people throwing parties you know and you know giving themselves chief test titles and having big parties they would rather invest that money into buying shares in in the banks so in my opinion that will address inflation now the only thing i'm not comfortable about in this policy is that as part of the bank's capitalization threshold, the central bank on this occasion is saying that retained earnings, which is what I call accumulated profit, is not going to be part of the capitalization threshold. 
Mm. And retained earnings is quite huge. The shareholders' fault is quite huge. So it means there are surpluses over the years. So what the CBN is trying to say indirectly is that we want fresh money to come into the system. You understand? So we don't want any of you recycling your, retained, your, your accumulated profit. We want new money, new injection of money to come into the, uh, into the uh, uh, banking sector. Therefore, if there is new money coming into the banking sector, by default, the bank too need to release that money one way or the other and would actually pump out more money by way of um, um, loans to, to, the, um, to the community and to the country and to make sure, you know, we become um, economically prosperous because when there are organizations are, um, who have access to funding can borrow money and they can loan it out, then therefore it will increase their ability to be able to expand economically. And therefore, when you expand economically, you need staff to power your organization. So I think it's, uh, I mean, it will not necessarily affect inflation. It will not necessarily increase inflation, but it will increase prosperity because banks will have more resources to loan out to people to uh, invest and um, increase the, their businesses. Well, okay. uh, so let me just follow up on something you said. You said you were not satisfied with the aspect of uh, where the, the, the policy is looking at... Um, banks, you know, sourcing for new money, so to speak. I'm wondering where they are to source this from uh, if we are talking about new money. Yeah, we already mentioned that earlier. So which is things like public offering, rights right. issues, um, private placement, mergers and acquisition, you know, uh, foreign direct investments, diaspora investments. So, you know, people like me, we want to invest in the banking sector now. You understand? And I'm sure other people in the diaspora as well might be attracted to invest in the banking sector. So therefore, bring it more FX into the country, which would then help to strengthen the Naira. Great. Interesting. So uh, if you go back to the issue of, um, you know, the recapitalization, there were preliminary feelers of mergers and acquisitions with the uh, outlook that businesses or business combination may play uh, big in the second half of 2025 and in the first quarter of 2026. So do you feel that the way things are point to the groundswell of optimism uh, in the sector with most banks uh, outlining substantial capital raising that could you know, make them to continue as uh, standalone stand entities based on the way you see it. So the jury is out on that because as I said, all the banks now are actually collectively looking for about 4 trillion naira. That is a lot of money. So yeah, so there are about four banks. I, sorry to bolt in. There are about four banks identified, you know, you know, to have, you know, to have that substantial, you know, capital. You talk about um, the GT. Talk about Zenith. Uh, I think Access Holdings and one other, one other bank. I can't remember. So they feel that those ones they even have more than enough, you know, because the the, the benchmark for them is five hundred uh, billion naira or thereabouts. So um, what about the other banks? What do you think will happen to them? Do you still, do you still share, share in that optimism that they might be able to catch up? By all means, if they are not able to catch up, then they become vulnerable to being taken over. Uh, that's the only way around. If you can't meet the threshold, then you will have to be taken and swallowed up by a bigger bank. And um, as you know, as we all said earlier, today is the deadline. So the, the, they will have to submit how they intend to meet those thresholds. Or they have a downgrade of their license. It's one or the other. So today is the um, D day for us to know what their plans are. Because I won't be surprised if some of those small banks' proposal to central bank is that, you know what, downgrade our license because we can't meet up to that threshold. Mm -hmm. Some of them might say that. Some of them might say they are ready for, to, be, to be swallowed up, be acquired by another bigger bank. So the jury is out, really. We get a feel as that um, some of the banks are already lobbying the CBN to extend the deadline because you know, they are, some, some are not able to meet up with it. Uh, yesterday, today, and they feel, okay, they should just extend the deadline. Do you feel that the CBN should accede to their plea uh, for them to extend the deadline in order for them to be able to, you know, catch up with the submission of the, their own strategy, uh, policy strategy? It depends on the case they put forward, really. If they have good mitigating circumstances, for why they should extend it, then I think the CBN should listen to those mitigating circumstances. But if there are frivolous mitigating circumstances, then the CBN needs to make a judgment call to say it's unrealistic for us to extend the deadline because you will never meet that target. So we're not going to waste our time deferring that deadline. So it depends on what they come up with, really, what they present to the CBN today. 
Now, the, we see the president moving across countries, you know, uh, talking about how ready Nigeria is for business. Earlier, you mentioned foreign direct investment, and the president has been pushing this narrative uh, to attract investors. But then there's the concerns within uh, the country about how, how ready we are to receive these persons uh, when they come to, to want to do business, how, it is, how conducive the environment is for businesses to thrive. Uh, we saw what happened where some companies said that they couldn't uh, get their monies out of the country, even though that has been resolved. What, what are the issues you would want the CBN to perhaps tackle as we look at uh, attracting foreign direct investment with this move of recapitalization? Now, I'd like to commend the president for what he's doing because his intention is pure. He wants to develop the country economically. As you know, he's an accountant, so I'm not surprised he's doing that. That is his orientation. However, before you go out there, capping and seeking capital, you need to make sure you tidy your own economical matrices first. I think within the country, we've still got huge economic challenges, which makes us unattractive to foreign direct investment. A classic example, if you go to the filling stations today, long queues. Today, some people might not even be able to go to work, which will affect productivity. And we are saying we're ready for foreign direct investment. Which foreign direct investor would be happy with that situation? We know the co how much it costs to fuel your generators. We know that the power sector has got serious challenges. They're even increasing their tariffs. With the old tariffs, they haven't supplied enough. Now they're even increasing their tariffs. We've got food insecurity. Because of the general insecurity in the company, uh, in the country, it's had a knock-on effect on food insecurity. So food is quite expensive. Oh, so people's salary now, bulk of the majority of people's salary now go on food. We need to do something about that. How we can improve food security to make sure the earnings of the average worker, majority of it does not go on food. So there are things that the, go the government needs to put in place for us, and CBN is a good conduit for them to be able to achieve this. So the governor of CBN, apart from trying to, as part of trying to make the country economically stable, there are other areas as well that we need to look into. We need to make sure the banks are ready to be able to provide capital for companies and the interest rate as well. The central bank controls the interest rates, which is what the banks use to lend money out. If that interest rate could come down slightly, then the loans will be affordable for investors to be able to invest in the economy. The, bank, the central bank has control of that. If they can look into that, that will really, really be helpful. And all the sectors need to have a joined up working. I, I, I remember about two weeks ago, the president invited all the big players within the corporates uh, to Astorok and had a conversation with them. And they all said they are ready. But we need to make sure the government provides the enabling environment for, for companies to thrive. So I think there's more work for the, um, for the um, government to do, but CBN is an important part of that. And as I said, I have confidence in the current CBN governor, and I just hope his plans come to reality and we can make sure our economy is thriving. I think we have the potentials. Mm. We just now need to develop that potentials and to make sure we have good mechanism in place to roll it out. We need to take our people out of poverty. There are too many poor people in the country. Over 133 million people are living in abject poverty. We need to deal with that by making sure we have um, sustainable measures to make sure they have access to, to, to funding and also the, the, their jobs. Jobs are being created, people are gainfully employed, they are economically active, to make sure we can kickstart this economy. We can do it. I am very positive, and this is the time to do it. And that's a fine place to live this conversation. Ronke Adiagbo, uh, a chartered accountant from the United Kingdom, thank you so much for your time on the program. Thanks for having me. All right, moving forward now, despite...